Hey there, it's Carrie. Thank you so much for joining me on this latest episode of Invisible Wounds Healing from Trauma. This is Early Childhood Trauma, Episode 6, Part 2, and we're going to talk about childhood trauma between the ages of 1 through 6. I am so glad that we're walking the path towards healing together. Just a quick reminder, I'm not a clinician, counselor, or physician. I'm a certified trauma support specialist with lots of lived experience with trauma. Also, the information presented in this podcast is for educational purposes only and not meant to replace treatment by a doctor or any other licensed professional. Also, as we talk about childhood traumatic experiences, this is not, I repeat, this is not me giving anyone parenting advice. I made a ton of mistakes as a parent. We all do, whether we have trauma histories or not. I'm taking information from published studies and readily available sources like the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, among others. I'm also going to talk about my personal experiences, what's made sense to me and helped me in the hopes of connecting some of my thoughts and feelings to things that you may have gone through. And as we go through this topic, it can get a bit triggering. If it does, stop listening, take a break, do some mindful belly breathing or any of the other exercises we've learned and come back when you're ready. All right, let's dive in. So in the last episode, episode five, we talked about how trauma can affect us before we're even born and as brand new little people. So in this episode, we're gonna look at how trauma can affect us as children between the ages of one and six years old. So let me tell you a quick story. A few months ago, I discovered ancestry in a big way. I mean, I'd been on it before, but for some reason, I suddenly became completely obsessed with it. I found a ton of old family photos, began scanning them in and adding them to our family tree. I spent weeks gathering and adding information from things I had, along with reaching out to old family connections, friends of my parents for stories, pictures, any bit of information I could get my hands on. Then one day, I just stopped. I was looking through some pictures of me with my parents as a newborn. I was being held by my parents They were looking happy together and smiling lovingly down at me. I mean, I really looked at those pictures. And I began to wonder to myself just what they'd do or how they'd react if they knew the hell that was waiting for them over the next 27 years of our lives. And that only ended with my mom's death. I wanted somehow to magically reach into those pictures wave my magic wand and fix all of the trauma, fix my parents and change the direction of all of our lives. I'm sure there's a lot of you out there listening that can relate to that. What we would do if we had that magic wand that we could fix things and change what happened to us. So suffice to say, I haven't been able to get back on Ancestry since that day And maybe I will again at some point, but definitely not for a while. So I thought I'd just give you a few statistics. It's estimated that 46% of children experience trauma at some point in their younger years. As many as 15% of girls and 6% of boys will develop post-traumatic stress after a traumatic or many traumatic events. And... I got to be honest with you, in my opinion, I think those numbers should be much, much higher. So my very first memory was from when I was about two to three years old. And I remember my dad keeping me away from my mom. My mother was chronically ill, as I've mentioned in the past. She was always sick, either in bed or in the hospital. 
So starting really early on, our relationship was completely flip-flopped. I took care of her. I parented her. She told me that I was the only reason she was still alive, and I took that very seriously. I, that became my full-time job, was to take care of her. So being separated from her absolutely terrified me. So when my dad would keep me from going into their bedroom so I didn't disturb her, I lost it. I can remember hearing her say, it's okay, it's okay, let her come in, let her come in and see me. And my dad just continued to restrain me and wouldn't let me go. I would throw the worst tantrums out of the fear I felt. I screamed, I cried, I struggled to break free from my dad's grip. And once I started, I couldn't stop or calm down. Children don't know how to do this on their own. They have to have a supportive person in their lives in order to work with them, to help them soothe or calm down. And I didn't have that. So my dad's solution to get me to calm down was to throw me fully clothed into an icy cold shower with the water on full blast. And being so little, I remember how terrifying that was for me. I don't know if I developed my deep fear of having water poured on my head before this or because of it, but for years after that, when I was little, that fear of having water poured on my head led to my poor mother having to painstakingly and carefully wash my hair in the kitchen sink. It was so scary for me. It took me years to get past that terror. It was so ingrained in me that I still remember it even now at 58 years old, just as clear as a bell. When young children are exposed to scary, distressing, disturbing, confusing, unpredictable, and other kinds of traumatic events, either with or from their caregivers or environment, it can have a very profound effect on them across their lifespan. Anything that they feel is a threat to their immediate safety in body, mind, or environment can be traumatic. They can also be affected by witnessing a traumatic event involving a loved one. Young children are like little sponges. They absorb everything through what their senses tell them. Small children's brains are still developing and they don't have life experiences or skills built in order to process and deal with things they don't understand. They can't understand the relationship between cause and effect. And this is the understanding that one event leads to another. And they haven't developed problem solving skills. So their fears, wishes, and what they think about them in their minds become very, very real to them. And they almost have a kind of power. They think that their thoughts, feelings, and emotions can turn into real things and situations. Young children have no idea how to keep themselves safe. So little children will often create extreme situations in their minds. So for example, underneath all of my fear at being separated from my mother was that she would go away or leave for good if I couldn't see her. And then I'd be left alone with my dad, who I was terrified of. Small children also feel that it's up to them to keep traumatic things from happening. They blame themselves along with their caregivers for not being able to keep them safe. I spent so much of my life when I was little, well, if I'm being honest, throughout my life, being so angry at my parents for not protecting me or making me feel safe or for not being able to change the outcome of things. I also felt that I was responsible, as I've mentioned before, for keeping my mom safe. Even when I was really small, often during their nightly fights, I'd lay in bed listening to their arguments as long as I could possibly stand it. And then if I felt my mom was in danger and I just couldn't take it anymore, I'd run out and get in the middle of it. 
This kind of confused thinking around reality just makes the impacts of trauma worse. So for small children, as we've talked about, their brains are still developing. According to the Centers for Disease Control, the first eight years of a child's brain development are crucial in beginning to lay a healthy foundation for future learning, health, and success in life. When they experience traumas, it can make physical changes to their brains. Early childhood trauma has been associated with creating a smaller area of the brain called the prefrontal cortex. And I've described this before as the thinking brain. This part of the brain is responsible for things like language, memory, attention, perception, problem solving, and other very important functions. A smaller thinking brain can lead to issues with IQ, the ability to regulate emotions, slowed language, learning development, and many other things. So for me, this led to my being terrified of everything as a small child. I never felt safe. I couldn't trust the adults in my life to protect me. I was terrified of going to sleep. I was actually afraid I'd stop breathing. I was afraid of waking up and everything in between. I had a really short attention span. I threw tantrums and had a very hard time learning. When I started school, I couldn't focus, concentrate, or pay attention. I was always afraid of what was coming next. I was in that hypervigilant fight, flight, or freeze mode constantly. I was living in survival mode. And that's pretty much the way I've lived my life. Small children also don't have the skills to put their thoughts, feelings, experiences, and emotions into words. For small children who've had traumatic experiences, they may act and behave in ways that their caregivers don't understand. They can be fearful, clingy, afraid of anything new. They can become impulsive, aggressive, have nightmares, and have difficulty sleeping. They may lose skills they've gained or go backwards in regard to learning and development. They might retreat and act younger than they are. So think of a child around the ages of five or six who's never sucked their thumb before or who stop sucking their thumb, going back to sucking their thumb. They also might seem detached and not responsive or numb. They feel helpless and out of control and overwhelmed by their own reactions as well as the reactions of others. They may physically get sick, have upset stomachs, have headaches, throw up or physically shake. The constant stress can weaken their immune systems and lower resistance to things like colds, infections, flu, and viruses. I was always sick as a child. And adults will sometimes say things about children. For example, they're little, they won't remember this, or kids don't pay attention to stuff they didn't see or hear or listen to us. Not always true. Children are very aware of what goes on around them, and this can be especially true if there's disruptive, disturbing, distressing, violent, or threatening behaviors and actions going on with their caregivers or in their environment. I listened very carefully to my parents' arguments. I would creep out of bed, hide behind a corner, or at the top of the stairs to hear what was going on. I needed to be ready for whatever was going to happen. So for me, as a small child, my mother's illnesses, frequent hospitalizations, both of my parents drinking in their mental health issues, frequent moves, their fights, their neglect of me, and many other problems led me to parentifying behaviors. I parented my mom and at times my dad. I felt that being a little adult, you know, taking care of my mom, cleaning the house, acting and speaking like a grown-up, 
gave me a little bit of control over my extremely chaotic life. And I'll give you an example of something that happened to me. So from a very early age, I could hear from downstairs the sound of my mother fainting and falling to the floor in their upstairs bedroom. There was a certain noise, a thud I could identify. So I'd immediately rush up the stairs, grab the smelling salts, which was a little glass tube containing very strong smelling ammonia and other chemicals, crush it and place it under her nose to try and bring her around. Then I'd grab a washcloth, get it damp, and dab it on her forehead and face to comfort her. I didn't panic. I knew exactly what to do. And think about this. I was maybe three, four years old at this time. I'm sure that at least some of you can relate to this kind of grown-up behavior. How many of you had to parent your parents or caregivers? Although learning at school felt almost impossible, I learned to read very early. Sesame Street, thank God for you. I learned by absorbing a lot of my own. I escaped into books and music. I had an old radio in my room that played the hits of the day constantly. The Beatles, Motown, pop hits of the 60s and later the 70s. I loved it all. I learned the words to both books and music by heart. I could recite them in my mind. Repetitive favorite things became comforting to me. I read my favorite books over and over again. There was safety and stability in that familiarness, which I didn't have in real life. I also retreated into a fantasy world. I made up all sorts of different scenes in my mind that constantly played like a tape loop. They all ended up with me confronting my parents. They would stop their behaviors. They would listen to me and become the magical kind of parents that I wanted and needed. Magical thinking using that magic wand we all wished we had. My behaviors completely baffled my parents and teachers alike. No one ever got it. Years later, when I was in my 30s, I gathered up every ounce of courage I had, and I talked to my dad one time about the reasons why I behaved the way I did when I was little. He told me that I was a very difficult child to love. Well, needless to say, we never talked about it again. And I'll go into this in a little more detail in a later episode when we talk about our almost desperate need to get answers around why the people in our lives have hurt us. That's a big topic. Whew, deep breath. So for those of us with childhood trauma, the really good news is that we can learn, gain knowledge about, and understand just how trauma has affected us. And when we recognize how it might still be showing up in our lives, we learn and use new coping skills, techniques, and tools to help us heal. We can't change what happened to us or how it's affected us, but we can rewire our brains using these tools, practicing them, and taking things that one tiny baby step at a time. So this is where I like to close us out with an exercise of some kind, something we can add to that coping skills toolbox we're building together. As always, you don't have to do this right now or at all if you don't want to, but you might just listen and tuck it away in your mind in case you ever need it. This is a very simple exercise from basic yoga and it's called child's pose. It's good for releasing muscle tension in the back, neck, and shoulders, and it's also calming, grounding, and can reduce anxiety. So this can either be done on the floor, or you can modify it by doing it on your bed. Before getting on the floor, place a mat, towel, or blanket on the floor as a cushion. 
So you want to begin on all fours, supported by your hands and knees. Your hands should be directly beneath your shoulders. Your knees should be directly beneath your hips. Your feet should be lined up behind your knees. Breathe slowly in through your nose, belly pushing out as you inhale for a count of five. Hold your breath for a count of one. Slowly exhale through your mouth for a count of five. Your belly should naturally move in as you exhale. Sit back onto your feet, keeping your feet and knees hips width apart. The soles of your feet will be facing the sky. So a modification for this, if needed, you can widen the space between the knees and feet, opening it up a bit for more support. Then gently lower your upper body forward, your belly resting on the top part of your upper thighs, resting your forehead on the floor or bed. So a modification you can add to relieve pressure on your forehead, place a towel or blanket to rest your forehead on. Allow your arms to rest loosely by your sides, hands by your feet, with your palms facing the sky. Focus on your breathing. Inhale slowly, gently stretching your spine. Exhale, relaxing your shoulders. If you're more comfortable, you can gently stretch your arms out forward with the palms of your hands on the floor. This is a relaxed and easy move. No forcing or stretching is needed. So a modification of this, if you need more support, either on the floor or on the bed, you can place a pillow or two between your knees, extending out away from your body. Lower your torso down, turning your head to one side to rest on top of the pillow. Then tuck your hands comfortably under the pillow. Your arms on each side should be relaxed. This is a resting pose. You can stay this way for 30 seconds or for a few minutes whatever you're comfortable with. Focus on your breathing slowly in through your nose and out through your mouth, releasing any tension that you feel. Gently notice the contact of your body, arms, forehead, and hands on the floor or on the bed. Feel yourself sink into the floor or the bed. When you're ready, gently move your arms in towards your body. Your arms from your elbows to your palms should be flat on the floor or the bed. Gently use your forearms to help support, lift, and raise your upper body back to a sitting position, sitting on your feet. Supportively move to a standing position or move your legs over the side of the bed to sit or stand as you want to. How do you feel? Do you feel calmer, more balanced, more relaxed? I hope this exercise is something you found helpful and it's another tool we can add to our mindful toolbox that we're building together. Whenever you need to go to that toolbox and pull out any skill we've learned in order to feel more grounded, safe, and connected, do it. I've created a list of all the techniques and exercises we've learned on my website, InvisibleWoundsHealingFromTrauma.com, and I'll keep adding to it as we go along. If you want to, you can go to the website copy the instructions and paste it into a Word document and keep it as a handy reference guide. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen today and please keep on listening. Wherever you listen, please like, subscribe, 
favorite, and follow me. What you think really matters to me too. So please, 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 please comment on the show. Let me know what you think, whatever's on your mind. You can find me on Facebook at Invisible Wounds Healing from Trauma, on Twitter at Carrie Walker 58, and my websites Invisible Wounds Healing from Trauma.com and End DV Now. Com. Look for my new episodes dropping every Monday on all of your favorite podcast and listening apps. Please take extra good care of yourself and we'll talk soon.